In this edition of Deadly Disasters, we look at two of the most shocking natural disasters of modern times. When a powerful earthquake off the coast of Japan unleashed a huge tsunami that surged six miles inland, it destroyed everything in its path, killing more than 15,000 people. It also flooded the Fukushima nuclear plant, causing a nuclear meltdown. Perhaps most shockingly, it actually shifted the Earth's axis by several centimeters, making this a natural disaster on a global scale. The second tsunami we investigate, the South Asian tsunami, occurred the day after Christmas also known as the Boxing Day Tsunami. It is one of Mother Nature's most distressing disasters. It wreaked death and destruction on an unprecedented and wide-reaching scale. The cause of the disaster was an undersea megathrust earthquake off the coast of Sumatra. The cataclysmic tsunami that ensued killed an estimated 280,000 people in 14 countries as it deluged coastal communities under waves 30 meters high. Tsunamis are unleashed when a major disturbance under the water creates a series of enormous waves. This disturbance can be caused by a landslide, volcanic eruption, and possibly even a meteorite. Scientists in the US have presented geochemical fingerprint evidence to suggest that a gigantic tsunami may have been caused by an asteroid striking the Earth many thousands of years ago. The proof may lie in a deep ocean crater between Madagascar and Australia. They point to curious features, such as the gigantic Fenambosi chevron near the tip of Madagascar, which is over 180 meters high and nearly five kilometers from the ocean. This giant tsunami may have surged around the globe, possibly more than once, and inundated every landmass apart from the highest mountains. Such a disaster would have altered the coastline of every continent and killed almost all life on land. But 80% of tsunamis are caused by an earthquake. A tsunami happens when a, a large earthquake, typically of magnitude greater than seven, is created by a fault that ruptures under the sea. And this fault, when it moves, it, it displaces the seabed and all of the water above it, generating a, a large wave. A tsunami is a truly terrifying force of nature. It can move at hundreds of kilometers per hour and then smash into land with waves as high as 30 meters, sometimes more. But how exactly do tsunami waves travel? From the place where the underwater disturbance occurs, waves move outwards, like the ripples when a stone lands in a pool. And unlike waves caused by wind, which only affects the water near the surface, the tsunami involves a rapid movement of water all the way down to the ocean floor. Out in the open sea, it may only be the tip of a huge wave that is visible. As it heads for land, the tsunami wave might only be 30 centimeters high and pass shipping unobserved. It can travel as fast as a jet airliner over vast distances and without losing its energy. But when it approaches the coast, the tsunami undergoes a dramatic transformation. As it gets close to land, the tsunami is slowed down in the shallower coastal water. This drastically reduces its speed from up to 900 kilometers per hour to around 30. As the faster moving water behind catches up with the slow water at the front, it causes a bunching effect which leads to a vast increase in the height of the wave, from just 30 centimeters to as high as 30 meters. 
the tsunami can strike the coast with a colossal force of energy, often in a series of waves lasting as long as an hour and reaching as far as 16 kilometers inland. Waves can come ashore for just a few minutes or over two hours apart. The first tsunami wave is usually not the largest. It is the following waves that can be the really big ones. As the tsunami rushes over dry land, it picks up an enormous amount of debris. All this gives the tsunami added destructive power. People are not only killed through drowning, many die as a result of being hit by heavy objects in the raging torrent. A tsunami can subject a building to colossal forces. Waves can generate up to 3,000 kilograms of pressure per square meter, enough to blow out modern reinforced concrete walls. That amount of pressure would even knock down a building designed to withstand an earthquake. The Japanese word tsunami translates into English as harbor wave. Japan has long endured the horror of tsunamis, and 80% of these devastating waves occur in the Pacific Ocean. The word entered the popular consciousness after the horrific events in South Asia, which became known as the Boxing Day Tsunami. Sunday, the 26th of December, 2004, dawned clear and bright. All over the Indian Ocean, people went about their morning routines. Western tourists on their Christmas holidays flocked to the beaches of Thailand, Sri Lanka, and Indonesia, enjoying the warm tropical sun and blue crystal clear sea. They had no way of knowing that many miles away, beneath the Indian Ocean, a fault line in the Earth's crust was about to give way and unleash 200 years of stored energy. The resulting megathrust earthquake would unleash a tsunami that created one of the deadliest natural disasters in modern history. It killed over 200,000 people and devastated the lives of millions. The epicenter of the earthquake was located about 250 kilometers southeast of the Indonesian city of Banda Aceh. The surface of the world is not one continuous solid sheet. It is made up of various enormous tectonic plates which slowly move and shift against each other. The Asian earthquake occurred at the eastern edge of the Indian Ocean, where over millions of years the Indian tectonic plate has been forced under the Burma plate. Like a tightening vice, tension had been building up within the subduction zone for perhaps 200 years, along a fault line of over 1,000 kilometers. When the stresses built up along that fault line suddenly gave way, it released a colossal amount of energy, equivalent to the explosion of 23,000 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs. The India plate literally shot under the Burma plate along the 1,000-kilometer fault line, creating a magnitude 9 megathrust earthquake. It was the third most powerful earthquake ever recorded. Astonishingly, it caused the entire planet to vibrate as much as one centimeter. Shaking lasted between eight and 10 minutes, making it the longest earthquake in history. At the earthquake's epicenter, the floor of the ocean was forced upwards by a monumental 10 meters, setting off the tsunami that would destroy the lives of millions of people. The powerful earthquake occurred at around 8 a.m. local time. 15 minutes later, the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center in Hawaii issued its first warning. Geologists in the United States initially rated the quake as a dangerous magnitude 8.1. But tragically, the region of Indonesia had no tsunami warning system in place for the hundreds of thousands of people living in the coastal areas. The warning ha relies on countries very far away, like Hawaii, like Japan, picking up on those earthquake signals that can then trigger the tsunami alarm. But it takes time to deliver that alarm to local people who might be impacted by the tsunami. They're very useful for 
giving advance warning because they're offshore. Um, however, they can only give information really about the location of the earthquake and the size of the earthquake. It's not possible to actually give much information about the tsunami that might arise. And despite a delay of up to several hours from the time of the earthquake to the impact of the deadly tsunami, nearly all of the victims were caught unawares. The coastal towns and villages on the tip of Sumatra, just 250 miles from the epicenter, felt the impact of the earthquake. Perhaps if they had known about tsunamis, they would have realized they only had a few minutes to prepare for its deadly onslaught. And my first ever tsunami was the Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004. And when I got there, I saw the level of devastation that was happening and the lack of understanding of the basic physics of tsunamis, the lack of understanding of how these waves propagate, how they propagate on shore, how they interact with buildings and, and how they damage structures. And that got me very interested in, in following this area for my research. Tsunamis are quite uncommon in the Indian Ocean. The first thing that people who had fled from collapsing buildings noticed was that the sea suddenly drew back from the shore. This was a second warning of the horrors to come, because the undersea event that disturbs the waters in the ocean doesn't only push water up into waves, it can also pull it down into troughs. When the trough reaches the shore, it will first suck the sea back from the coastline, sometimes for several hundred meters. Along the coast of Sumatra, the sea withdrew, and some curious people went down to the beach to explore the newly exposed shore. But just as quickly as the ocean had pulled out, it came rushing back in, this time in a series of gigantic waves. The highest was 30 meters tall when it smashed into towns and villages on the coast. The water rushed inland, obliterating everything in its path. One of the few buildings in Banda Aceh to remain unscathed was the Beta Raman Grand Mosque. Hundreds of survivors took refuge there. Others were not so fortunate. As the tsunami cut its terrible swathe across Indonesia, an estimated 168,000 people were swept to their deaths. So my, my house has been destroyed, everything. Destroyed? Yes. Some coastal villages lost 70% of their population. That means that in certain parts of Indonesia, only three out of every 10 people survived. The hotels and beaches on the west coast of Thailand and Phuket were full of tourists enjoying some winter sun. By the time they heard the roar of the tsunami and the screams of people telling them to run, it would have been too late. The first waves that hit were up to three meters tall, followed by waves that were even higher. They had such power that large boats tied up at piers were heaved more than 50 meters inland. It destroyed everything in its path. Tsunami waves swamped the coast, and it was two and a half hours before the sea level returned to normal. By that time, more than 5,000 people had lost their lives, including over 2,000 tourists from all over the world. Many drowned in their hotel rooms, while others were out enjoying the sea when the wave first struck. Having decimated Thailand, the tsunami powered its way across the Indian Ocean, hitting the Maldives, where waves overran the low-lying islands and killed 108 people. Two hours after the initial earthquake, the Andaman and Nicobar Islands were rocked by a 7.3 magnitude aftershock. At about the same time, the tsunami reached Sri Lanka. Despite the vast distance from the original earthquake, the waves that destroyed fishing villages and coastal towns were still four meters high. Survivors who lived 100 meters inland heard people screaming that the sea was coming, 
They thought it was a joke until they saw a mass of black water churning towards their homes. So when we've looked out over our balcony, we've got up the high. height of the water, it was just, it was incredible to think because it wasn't loads of big waves. It was the same waves, but just here. As many as 31,000 people lost their lives on the east of Sri Lanka. The tsunami raced on to the southeast coast of India, where nearly 10,000 people were killed around Chennai. In Sri Lanka and India, most of the victims were women and children. Many men survived because they were out fishing and hardly noticed the tsunami waves, which seemed insignificant out in the open sea. Meanwhile, their wives were waiting on beaches for them to return with their catches or at home with their children when the tsunami struck. When the fishermen returned to their towns and villages, they were horrified to find them utterly destroyed. Even then, the tsunami was not finished. This is an event that only happens, say, every 500 to 1,000 years. So people don't have a living history of, of tsunamis in the area, and they were not prepared for such a large event. Not only that, but locally in Bandarache, they had a natural warning, which is the ground shaking, but further away, like in the Maldives or in Sri Lanka, they wouldn't have felt the ground shaking, and so the arrival of the tsunami was very much a surprise. Over seven hours after the earthquake, the waves had traveled some 7,000 kilometers across the vast expanse of the Indian Ocean and now reached the east coast of Africa. Globally, five million people were directly affected by the disaster. 1.7 million were made homeless, half a million injured, and more than 230,000 were killed. 1.5 million children were wounded, displaced, or orphaned. As well as the human cost, many irreplaceable World Heritage Sites were destroyed or damaged, including the old town of Gaul in Sri Lanka, the tropical rainforest of Sumatra in Indonesia, and the sun temples of Konark in India. Many fishermen survived but lost everything to the tsunami. They were left with nothing with which to earn a living or feed their families. As time wore on, the lack of food, clean water, and medical treatment only increased the list of civilian casualties. There were concerns about some of the, um, the post-tsunami health risks, um, most notably around cholera and malaria. Um, now, um, fresh water, bottled water, uh, got on the, um, the location fairly quickly, and so cholera didn't become um, an epidemic. And actually, um, the mosquitoes that would have caused malaria, um, their breeding grounds were affected by the salt water from the tsunami inundation, so in fact, um, malaria wasn't an issue. Instead, many survivors were afflicted with a new type of pneumonia, which hadn't been observed before. This became known as tsunami lung. Essentially, people who'd been caught up in the tsunami had inhaled seawater uh, with entrained mud and bacteria. And this had led to a, a pneumonia-like condition, which would normally have been treated in the early stages by antibiotics. But because of the damage to the, the health infrastructure, that wasn't possible, and those diseases escalated into more serious effects, such as paralysis and abscesses. Relief workers also faced the difficult task of trying to get supplies into remote areas where roads had been destroyed. To make matters worse, the two places most affected by the disaster, Sri Lanka and the Aceh area of Indonesia, were both in the middle of bitter civil conflicts, which meant that aid work was fraught with complications. Nevertheless, the foreign aid response to the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami raised 6.25 billion US dollars, more than any other natural disaster to date. 
The pledges of aid from around the world, particularly from the public, made this the most generous and quickly funded humanitarian response in history. And the quickest is uh, the money that we can remit immediately. Next is surgical equipment and medicines, which can airlift. Uh, later on, we want to have the clothing and foodstuffs that we can send by ship, which we have already arranged. In the UK, the Disasters Emergency Committee raised £10 million in just one day. The money went through a central UN relief fund, the majority to provide food, shelter and health provisions to the 14 countries most severely affected by the tsunami. Indonesia was its greatest beneficiary, receiving a billion dollars worth of aid. Sri Lanka received 650 million, while India was granted 150 million. The World Food Programme delivered 110,000 tons of food to the disaster zone within five months of the emergency. Enough food for over two million people. More than 187 million US dollars of the appeal funding was spent on emergency supplies and to build long-term shelter for survivors. After a large disaster, there is often a scare that there might be some rather large epidemics causing more casualties and, and deaths. And in the case of the Indian Ocean tsunami, uh, this wasn't the case. It didn't materialize. And this was largely thanks to um, people like the World Health Organization, international uh, NGOs, local governments, and health authorities really working together to monitor uh, epidemics, monitor diseases as they started, and so to stop the spread of epidemics. Following the disaster, 13,700 homes were built in Aceh alone. The sheer scale of the disaster and the emergency operation it produced enabled aid agencies to learn valuable lessons in how to conduct disaster relief. Experts realized that rather than providing survivors with new homes, it was often cheaper and quicker to give them training and materials so that they could build them on their own. But why did this tsunami cause so much death and destruction? For one thing, the waves struck coastal areas that were densely populated. Many people in these areas had also never experienced a tsunami before and were largely unaware of what to look out for or how to respond. This is why advance warnings can sometimes be useless. If you are unable to get the proper information out to the people in immediate danger, how are you supposed to protect them? Luckily, the majority of the 27 countries with coastlines on the Indian Ocean have since created programs for issuing tsunami alerts to their citizens. Although it is not possible to protect entire coastlines from the dangers of tsunamis, it is possible to educate people in tsunami-prone areas about what to look out for and how to act if a tsunami is about to strike. The success of tsunami education was illustrated by the extraordinary case of Tilly Smith. By an amazing coincidence, she had studied tsunamis in a geography lesson just two weeks before she and her family set out on a beach holiday to Thailand. When she saw the sea frothing with bubbles and receding, she recognized these danger signs. Together with her parents, she warned the other holidaymakers on the beach who evacuated to safety. It was one of the few beaches in the area with no reported casualties. Many were not so fortunate. 10 years after these terrible events, the dead were paid ceremonial tributes by the living. In Ban Nam Kem, a fishing village in southern Thailand destroyed by the tsunami, hundreds of lanterns were lit to symbolize the spirits of its victims. Much of the money that was raised to help survivors of the South Asian tsunami came from Japan. In fact, Japan was the most generous donor to the tsunami relief effort, committing over 500 million US dollars, as well as sending over more than 100 emergency workers. In a tragic irony, Japan required its own relief aid just seven years later. The country that had donated so much now needed help from others.
On the 11th of March 2011, a magnitude 9 earthquake shook northeastern Japan, unleashing a savage tsunami. The effects of the huge earthquake reverberated around the world. From the fjords of Norway, where the tsunami created one and a half meter waves, to Antarctica in the south, where satellite photos revealed the creation of huge icebergs caused by tsunami waves smashing into the ice shelf. Even years later, debris from the tsunami has continued to wash up on North American beaches. Despite experiencing more tsunamis than any other place in the world, Japan was still devastated because of the failure to plan for the aftermath of such a powerful earthquake. The March 11th earthquake struck on a Friday at 2.46 in the afternoon, local time. The epicenter was shallow, just 24 kilometers beneath the surface of the seafloor, and 72 kilometers from Tohoku on the east coast. It was the most powerful earthquake ever recorded in Japan, and the fourth most powerful in the world since records were first recorded. The shaking lasted about six minutes. It moved Honshu, the main island of Japan, 2.4 meters closer to North America. It even shifted the Earth's axis by several centimeters. The earthquake that generated the uh, Japanese tsunami occurred along the Japanese trench in the north part of the Honshu Island. Um, and it was a massive earthquake that no one would have thought could have happened. Indeed, the Japanese were not prepared for this. The Japanese trench is thought to be divided into six parts. And it was only ever thought that two of these parts could rupture and that a magnitude earthquake of up to 8.2. But in the case of, of the 2011 event, essentially all six of these parts of the fault ruptured in one go, causing a massive magnitude nine earthquake uh, and on ensuing tsunami. Residents of Tokyo received a minute's warning before the city began to shake. Thanks to the country's strict earthquake building codes, many deaths were prevented. The early warning systems also caused high-speed trains to stop, as well as factory assembly lines. Citizens in Japan also received text alerts on their mobile phones, warning of both the earthquake and the tsunami. But the shaking was only a prelude to the disaster that was to engulf the country. Still shaking. You know, the earthquake happening. O almost, I feel like maybe every hour or so. The earthquake caused the sea floor to thrust upwards by 10 meters over an area of 14,000 square kilometers, the size of the whole state of Connecticut in the US. A vast volume of seawater was disturbed, and just like the aftermath of the Sumatra earthquake, it caused a colossal tsunami. Nine minutes after the earthquake struck, a regional tsunami alert was issued. In the closest area to the quake, residents had little more than 15 minutes of warning before the first of the ferocious tsunami waves pounded the coastline. Shockingly, the earthquake had caused a 400 kilometer stretch of shoreline to drop by more than half a meter. This allowed the tsunami that quickly followed to travel further and faster inland, as far as 10 kilometers. Thousands of lives were lost and entire towns were wiped off the map as waves of up to 38 meters high struck the north of Japan's eastern Pacific coastline. They easily overwhelmed the sea walls that were not high enough to resist the giant tsunami. People tried desperately to find some area of safety, higher ground, or structures tall enough to raise them above the seething mass of water, trees, rocks, and cars. For every uh, 10 frustrations, you will possibly get one, uh, one good one. So we just have to keep plugging away, and uh, whatever comes up, we just have to deal with it. I think they knew the tsunami was coming, but I didn't think it was going to be this you know, big. It's getting more difficult. 
to believe that they are okay. Buildings as high as three stories, where people had imagined they would be safe, were easily destroyed. Structures that caught fire when ruptured gas mains set them alight were swept away, with smoke and flames pouring off them. It was like a scene from hell. At its peak, the water was 40 meters high. Half a million people were forced out of their homes. When the floodwaters retreated back to the sea, they swept out vast amounts of debris, as well as thousands of victims that had been caught in the flood. Near Arai, the tsunami generated a huge offshore whirlpool. Sendai Airport had already been badly damaged by the earthquake. As the warnings of the impending tsunami sounded, people on the ground fled onto the roofs of the terminal buildings and into the control tower. The floods completely submerged the tarmac, taxiways and runway, and even reached parts of the second level of the passenger terminal. 1,300 people were stranded within the terminal for two days. By then, the Japanese had begun to coordinate their disaster response. 50,000 Japan Defense Forces personnel, 190 aircraft, and 25 ships were urgently deployed to help with rescue efforts. The tsunami waves triggered by the earthquake traveled right across the Pacific. They were still powerful enough to reach 3.6 meters high when they hit the Hawaiian Islands. Several hours later, the coasts of California and Oregon in North America were struck by tsunami waves that were 2.7 meters high. Even Chile, some 17,000 kilometers away, was struck by tsunami waves which were two meters high when they reached the shore. 18 hours after the quake, waves reached the coast of Antarctica and caused 125 square kilometers of the Salzburger ice shelf to crack off its outer edge. The tsunami was alarming in its global reach. But even more alarming were fears of a forthcoming disaster that were beginning to emerge from the Fukushima nuclear power plant, located on the coast 65 kilometers south of Sendai. First commissioned in 1971, the plant consisted of six boiling water reactors and 4.7 gigawatts of electrical energy, making Fukushima one of the largest nuclear power stations in the world. By chance, three of the six reactors were already offline for maintenance work when the earthquake struck. As soon as the earthquake was detected, early warning systems kicked in and automatically shut down power to the remaining three reactors. At this point, the only thing cooling the plant was the reactor's emergency diesel generators and DC batteries. These were located in the basements of the reactor turbine buildings. This obviously made them vulnerable to flooding, a concern that had been raised at the time of construction. In order to protect the low-lying generator from the risks of flooding, a 5.8-meter sea wall was constructed. The Fukushima designers assumed that this would provide adequate protection for the maximum wave height of any tsunami, but they were gravely mistaken. An hour after the automated shutdown, a 14-meter tsunami wave hit the nuclear facility. It quickly burst over the 5.8-meter seawall and flooded the plant, disabling all but one of the underground generators. Most of the emergency systems, which were supposed to cool the generator's nuclear cores, failed. Only one portion remained in operation, a steam and battery system, which hadn't been used or even tested in 40 years. They seem to have lost their outside power connections, and worse still, the emergency diesel generators that start up, snap into action to keep the reactor core, they failed as well. At 9 p.m. on the day of the tsunami, the Japanese government declared a nuclear emergency. 
60 to 70,000 people living within three kilometers of the plant were ordered to evacuate. The situation uh, in Fukushima, uh, it's uh, evolving every day, and uh, we do accept that uh, you know, there are a number of issues you know, that, that we have to tackle. On the 12th of March, the day after the tsunami, the emergency backup battery for Reactor 3 ran out, leaving the radioactive fuel rods dangerously exposed. The evacuation zone was expanded to 20 kilometers. On the 13th of March, the situation was declared a level four on the internationally recognized scale of nuclear events, meaning that this was now a nuclear accident posing a danger to all life in the local environment. The lack of power resulted in intermittent blackouts for parts of Tokyo and eight nearby prefectures. Up to 45 million people would be subject to life without electricity for up to a month. On the 14th of March, a major explosion occurred in one of the reactors, raising the threat level to six and designating it as a serious nuclear accident. Two days later, Emperor Akihito gave a rare public address. He urged the nation not to give up hope, stating that they needed to understand and help each other. A televised address by a sitting emperor is an extraordinarily rare event, happening only in times of war or extreme crisis. It confirmed to Japan and the rest of the watching world just how grave the situation had become. About twice as many people will require evacuation under a mox fueled reactor accident. About one and a half times more will die in the interim, and about two to three times more will actually die in the longer term. So it has a very significant radiological impact on the aftermath of an accident. Over the following days, there were more explosions and a fire. Radiation was now leaking from the plant. The authorities brought in helicopters to drop water on the exposed fuel rods and sent fire engines from Tokyo to spray water on the damaged reactors. The spent fuel uh, rods are stored in ponds located close to the reactors. And one in particular, the, the pond in reactor four, is a cause of very considerable concern. Basically, what has happened is that this has been damaged by um, explosions in, the, in the, that hole and it is leaking very far. The situation grew worse as white, billowing smoke became visible from two of the reactors. Three days later, technicians monitoring the reactors suspected a breach in one of the containment vessels. This meant that radioactive water could now be leaking from the power plant. The US Navy went to the aid of the beleaguered nuclear plant as a barge with 8.3 million liters of fresh water arrived at the scene. The evacuation zone was extended to a radius of 30 kilometers around the plant forcing 100,000 people to leave the area. An aerial video was taken, showing the first detailed images of the extent of the damage to the nuclear plant. TEPCO, the company who owned Fukushima, seemed unable to properly resolve the situation and avoid a probable disaster. What was happening at Fukushima was now causing major concern all over the world. U.S. authorities in the state of Washington admitted to finding traces of radioactive iodine in milk. On the 3rd of April, the bodies of two missing workers were found on the site. They had died from injuries caused by the tsunami. Next, the plant was rocked by an aftershock measuring 7.1, causing workers to evacuate the plant as quickly as possible. The incident at Fukushima was raised again to level seven, the highest possible classification. Not since the 1986 explosion at Chernobyl in the former Soviet Union had the world faced a nuclear disaster on this scale. In the case of Chernobyl, the, 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 apart from the devastation in the immediate neighborhood of the reactor, there was a huge fire which carried the radioactivity very high into the stratosphere. and. 
eventually around the globe. One, after Chernobyl, or maybe in, uh, worse than Chernobyl, probably the most serious nuclear accident that, that, that is likely to ever occur, because we have the possibility of four nuclear reactors uh, melting down, exploding, and releasing their hundreds of tons of nuclear fuel into the environment. There was now the risk of a major release of radioactive material with widespread danger to health and the environment. The site was so dangerous that two robots were sent into the plant to assess the situation. Their findings confirmed that radiation levels were now the highest yet recorded. Ten weeks after the crisis first began, the president of TEPCO was forced into resignation as Japan's nuclear emergency response headquarters reported that three of the reactors had gone into complete meltdown. Levels of plutonium and other radioactive particles were found outside the 30-kilometer evacuation zone around the stricken plant. While efforts continued to remove contaminated water from beneath the power plant, it was not until nine months after the tsunami that authorities announced a timetable for decommissioning the reactors. They admitted that it will take 30 to 40 years to fully resolve this terrifying disaster. An interim report into the incident concluded that both the Japanese government and employees in charge of the nuclear facility contributed to the severity of the catastrophe. Two years after the earthquake and ensuing tsunami, thousands marched onto the streets of Japan's capital, Tokyo, urging the government to turn its back on nuclear power. The battle to control the radioactive water which is pooled under the Fukushima plant remains ongoing. In June 2014, work began to install the equipment needed to create an ice wall. At a cost of 320 million US dollars in public funds, 1,500 tubes filled with seawater were sunk 30 meters deep in a ring which stretched 1.5 kilometers around the plant. The plan was to cool the seawater to minus 30 degrees Celsius. That would freeze the soil into a solid wall and block groundwater flowing under the plant and adding to the vast pool of contaminated water. By December 2015, all the necessary equipment was in place. And three months later, it began to create the wall of frozen soil. On top of the building costs, maintaining the ice wall consumes roughly 44 million kilowatt hours of electricity every year. That's enough energy to power around 15,000 typical Japanese homes. Still in operation, it has not proved to be as successful as hoped. In March 2018, a government commission panel said it was only partially effective. As water continues to seep under the plant, it becomes radioactive, resulting in vast amounts of toxic water. This first needs to be pumped out, then decontaminated, and finally stored in vast tanks at Fukushima. To date, there are now 1,000 tanks holding a staggering 1 million tons of wastewater. If things continue as they are, they will simply run out of space by early 2021. One of the most heartrending stories to emerge from the disaster was what happened to the children of Okawa Elementary School, located in Ishinomaki, 322 kilometers north of Tokyo in the Miyagi Prefecture. The tragedy that unfolded revealed emergency planning problems that led to terrible losses of life. Though the teachers knew exactly what to do in the case of an earthquake, they had no clear evacuation plan in the case of a tsunami. They even ignored repeated warnings from some concerned pupils, suggesting they should make for higher ground. At 3.30 p.m., following an earthquake, it became clear that something terrible was about to happen. There was no time to escape. The school, the teachers, the parents and their children were all engulfed by a 20-meter wall of water and hurling debris. Of the 78 children who were at school, all but four perished instantly.
only one of the 11 teachers survived. The scale of the human tragedy at Okawa Elementary School is almost impossible to comprehend. An investigation into what had happened said that not only the school, but also the Board of Education, as well as the city government, had made no plans for such an unprecedented natural disaster. A map which showed those areas vulnerable to tsunamis did not include the school. And the school's disaster manual didn't consider the dangers of a tsunami, meaning that prior to the tsunami, no evacuation drills were ever conducted. Parents of 23 of the children who had lost their lives sued the city authorities for negligence. On the 26th of October, 2016, the courts announced their verdict. The Okawa parents won their case and were awarded 1.4 billion yen. The earthquake and resulting tsunami destroyed roughly 28,000 homes in Ishinomaki. The city lost more than 3,000 of its residents, with almost as many reported missing. In 2015, they were visited by Prince William, the Duke of Cambridge, who insisted that he not travel to Japan without meeting face to face with victims of the tsunami. He was told by the former head of the city's daily newspaper that for most of Ishinomaki citizens, the tsunami loomed larger than the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Cities all over the Miyagi prefecture were caught in the onslaught. In the city of Kesen Numa, a fleet of massive tuna ships were swept far inland and dumped along the highway. One of them remained there for several years. For some, it was seen as an accidental monument, a standing testament to their miraculous survival. For others, it was a stark reminder of their terrible loss. In an assessment of the country's response to the disaster, some disturbing facts emerged. Japan's meteorological agency was found to have issued a tsunami warning which severely underestimated the actual size of the wave. This could be one of the reasons why, despite feeling the earthquake, only 58% of people in areas such as Fukushima and Miyagi made for the safety of higher ground. Many people didn't take the risk to their personal safety seriously enough. They had lived through tsunamis before and assumed that this one would be no different. When you land in these areas and, and you see just the extent of devastation, all the housing washed away, there's nothing there. And people's possessions are littered everywhere. It really, um, it really brings to the fore how devastating something like this is, but not only to the built environment, but to actual people. There is a hope, I think, um, amongst engineers that we can learn from mistakes of the past, um, design, build better, um, maybe avoid um, putting people in harm's way. The effects of the tsunami will be with us for years to come, not only in the ongoing efforts to contain the nuclear disaster at Fukushima, but with the debris that continues to float around our oceans. It shows us all too clearly that it doesn't matter where on the planet you live, we all suffer the consequences of Mother Nature's deadly disasters.